John 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, circle Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. Underline verse five, one man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years, circle 38. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, circle this sentence, do you want to be healed? And the sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, get up, circle get up, take up, circle take up your bed, the mat that you're laying on and walk, circle walk. And at once the man was healed, circle healed. And he took up his mat, his bed, and he walked. Now that day was the Sabbath, circle Sabbath. This is, the, this is our Saturday. The Sabbath is the last day of the Jewish work week, which is our Saturday. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, who is this man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and he said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more, circle sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. And the man went away and he told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father, circle father, is working until now. And I, circle I, am working. Verse 18, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Underline this, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling God his own father, making himself what? Equal with God, circle equal with God. I want you, I want you to be really clear. This is an extraneous point, not even to the point I'm making today. But Jesus is not a religion. Christianity isn't a religion of multiple religions in your uh, religious studies class It's in college. And anybody that ever says, like your religious studies teacher, when he goes, eh, you know, Christianity is one of the world religions, blah, 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 go, the difference is, is that Jesus claimed to be God. So if Jesus claimed to be God and was wrong, we shouldn't follow him at all because he's psycho. But if Jesus is God and backed it up, then he is not a religion. He is actually God coming into contact with humanity. So it's Jesus making a world relationship with God, not a world religion. So understand, because sometimes I hear this, hey, Jesus never really claimed to be God. He was just a good prophet. He was just a good guy. He was just a good teacher. They got him, he was put to death because of blah, blah. No, he's put to death because he claimed to be God. And it's in John 5. And people understood that that's what he was claiming. That was totally free. Number one is this, ready? Here we go. Number one is this. Jesus journeys to disrupt lives. Jesus journeys to disrupt lives. How many of you guys have ever had your life disrupted by God? Seven people. I got a lot of work to do. Holy cow. Here's the reason I tell you that. Ready? Because sometimes we don't recognize that it's God working in our lives. Sometimes we just call it circumstance or we call it chance or we call it, um, you know, the end result of things I've done, which some of that can be true. But the reality is, is God uses everything in our life to get our attention. And you know, one of the main things he uses in our life to get our attention is pain. Could be physical pain. Could be mental or emotional pain. A lot of us this last year have gone through the most anxiety the most like fear, the most insecurity we have felt in our whole lives. When it came to the political scenario that we went through last year, when it came to the social scenarios we went through last year, when it came to some of us lost our finances. I mean, we just went through trauma after trauma after trauma, just mentally and emotionally. It wasn't like somebody was punching us in the face. It was like mentally in our minds, we're like, I can't get a break. Like I feel just off. I feel anxious and just wrecked inside. So sometimes pain can be physical. 
Some of us have pain that we were born with. Some of us have chronic pain from an accident. Some of us were really stupid in college and we're still suffering for things we did at our bachelor party or whatever. So some pain in our lives is self-inflicted. Some pain we've had not part of our, like we didn't do it to ourselves, but it's been part of our lives for years. And some of us have relational pain. We have broken relationships that when we think about those relationships, whether it's with our spouse or our kids or somebody at work, it's like it causes us emotional pain, things we want to get away from. Well, guess what? If there's a God, pain has a, a point. If there's a God, your pain has a, has a point. There's a reason for it. If you think there is no God, I don't believe in God, God, God talk is, is ridiculous, understand that your pain has no, no point. There's a reason many people will feel like it'd be better if I was dead. I don't want to, then, then live another day in this pain, mental or physical or whatever it is. But here's the, here's why I want you to realize your pain has a point if you know what the point is from God. And that will give you hope through the pain that someday maybe the pain will end. And it does for this man here. So let's walk through this because this is going to be like a surgeon. I'm, I'm going to go, in, I'm going to get into your heart and some of it's going to be uncomfortable, but I'm hoping that God will bring healing into those areas or at least give you, illuminate your mind on what might be true about your life, even if you're going through a hard time. So number one is this, Jesus journeys to disrupt lives. He's going to the pool on purpose to disrupt somebody's disability. In North Jerusalem, above the temple, there was a pool called Bethesda, meaning house of mercy. So if you're ever reading your Bible and you see like places called Beth something, it's like Bethlehem, Bethel, Bethesda. The word Beth on the front end of a Hebrew word means house, house of something, whatever that is on the backside. So this is Bethesda, which is Beth, uh, house of mercy. Bethel is house of God. El is the shortened form of, of God. So understand that this whole, this is a huge outdoor public pool complex called House of Mercy. How many of you guys would call a, a large outdoor pool a House of Mercy? That's public goes and uses. You might call that a House of Diseases or a House of, uh, I picked up something at the pool that I didn't have when I went there type of place. Probably not so much the public pool you'd call the House of Mercy. But this is what it's called. And you know why it's called that? It's because they believed that God healed people there at this particular pool. So we're going to take a look at why that is, but I want you to see where it is. So this is a Google map, a vertical map of uh, modern day Jerusalem. And when we go to Israel, we will walk by this pool, which they just uh, excavated about the last uh, couple decades. And what I want you to see here from the sky is that gold dome in there is the Dome of the Rock, which the Muslims control the whole Temple Mount up there. They don't allow uh, Jews up there very rarely. And um, back in Jesus' day, 2,000 years ago, the temple would have stood right where the Dome of the Rock is today. That little square where the Dome of the Rock is, if you expand out to that other big square, is the temple mount that Herod built before Jesus was born. So the Pool of Bethesda was just outside the temple area. Jesus is walking to the temple, decides to stop at the Pool of Bethesda, to interact with this, uh, this man who has, a, has an issue. But I want you to see it's right there. This story took place right just outside the temple uh, in, the, in the city of Jerusalem. The pool was possibly stirred by an angel who may have either used the natural mineral properties in the water to heal people or may have caused a miracle of healing. Ready? Sometimes healing is from natural processes because God built our bodies to heal itself and use natural things in the world to heal us. And sometimes supernatural, God can use both. Sometimes God uses natural things to heal and sometimes God can supernaturally heal you. God can still do miracles in our day. God still does miracles today. Some, many times um, it's miracles that we don't even recognize that God has done or didn't do it in the way that we thought it was so we don't recognize it as a miracle, but God did those things. And sometimes, most of the time, it's just natural things. Your body heals itself. You get over pain. It, you, know, you use medicines that are natural to, to heal yourself. I want to bring up something. Everybody pay attention. Because I get this many times as a pastor. 
uh, people will ask me, hey, is it, is it like sinful to take like narcotics? You know, like if I'm going into surgery or something, if I, if I take narcotics or if I've got pain, I, is it okay to smoke pot? Um, you know, like what's, what's kind of the, the border of what God allows? Because obviously your body is miraculously built by God to heal itself. Like your body goes, when you injure yourself, your body automatically goes into let's fix it mode. Broken bones, bones, you know, cut skin. It'll try to heal. It's amazing. Your body's a, a, a marvel of, of modern work of God. Because you, you don't even have to tell your skin, you better heal or I'm going to bleed out. Your skin just goes, let's fix this. And your blood cells go, let's, let's clog this thing up so we don't bleed out. It's amazing. Involuntarily, your body starts to fix itself. You're, literally, your body is an evidence that, that God is real. Like science can't even figure out why your body goes to fix those things. But here's the thing. The, the, the amazing advancement of science has discovered how God built the body. So it, it can use pharmaceuticals to help those things happen faster. Let your nerves be deadened so you don't feel pain. Help your body heal faster and quicker because science has discovered how God made the body. Here's the, here's the thing I want to say. Ready? There's nothing wrong with pharmaceuticals as long as pharmaceuticals don't become habitual to the degree that you're addicted. And so I'm going to walk into some areas of your life right now that maybe you're uncomfortable with, but I don't care because I want to walk through it because I want to help you, ready? Because this is a part of our culture now. Our culture kind of goes, hey, you know, pot's legal. Um, you know, I, I smoke pot on the, you know, Saturday afternoons or whatever to relax, or I got glaucoma all over my body. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I smoke pot because I can't see really good out of my kneecaps, and so I need to, uh, you know, whatever. Let me fix something for you, ready? The THC in pot is for the high, okay? The CBD side of, of marijuana is is the side that your body uh, connects with to reduce inflammation, to stop pain. So you don't, you don't need the medicinal side of marijuana to have THC in it to get the, 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 the body fixing side of it. So if, you're, if you've already deceived yourself into thinking, dude, I just need to get stoned to like get rid of my pain, it's actually not the THC doesn't do the, doesn't do the pain reducing. It just makes you feel high. So, so understand, if you, if you want to use marijuana, okay, but you don't have to get stoned to get the medicinal use out of, out of marijuana. Let me be clear about that, okay? So it's, same thing is true because some of you are addicted to pot and you're thinking, oh, God's okay with it because it's natural. God made plants. <laughs> well, he didn't make plants like that, okay? And you can say that about anything. So stop, stop deceiving yourself. Stop thinking, oh, God made these plants and we can, I'm just happened to roll them up and put them in my mouth and smoke them. I just had, it just fell into my mouth, officer. I don't know how. So listen, same thing is true with hard, with hard pharmaceuticals, painkillers, right? Um, the stuff you get from over the counter. Listen, we are, we are a culture saturated in drugs. We are the most drugged culture in the history of the world. Nobody is overly, you can literally go to the counter and buy things that even 100 years ago, they would have never prescribed to anybody just because of the pain-killing abilities in it and that it can become addictive. So understand this. There's nothing wrong with using what science has conjured up to help the body that God made get better. You have a surgery, you can get over pain better because it'll until your body heals, you can take painkillers until it gets over. Here's the problem, is when you start using those things in an addictive form, whether it's drinking, whether it's drugs, whether it's pills, whether it's smoking, and only you know when God's convicting you of like, this is a, this is a snare in your life. And God is faithful to you. He'll, t he'll let you know, hey, nothing wrong with getting past the pain with these drugs, but now we're past it. Your surgery was 68 years ago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And you're still getting that prescription. So listen, be honest with yourself. Be honest with God and go, I'm addicted to this but I'm struggling. Okay, let's at least be honest. And then we work our way out of addiction. But don't think in your mind, um, this is kind of natural. This is who I am. This is blah, blah, blah. No, it's, it's something different than that. Pharmaceuticals are okay. I, I praise God that God has allowed our scientific community to come up with the pharmaceuticals we have. I, I praise God for that. But the difference, 
the, the issue isn't drugs, the issue is addiction. When it goes beyond its intended use, then you know you're addicted. That was totally free. Here we go. Ready? <laughs> People laid under five covered porches around this pool, waiting for this stirring to occur. A man had been going there for 38 years with his infirmity. So the Greek word uh, invalid in there, which we don't use too much anymore in the English, but the Greek word trans translated um, invalid, which just basically means, the Greek word means weak, means he couldn't get up, or that if he could get up, he was really weak. So he may have had a neurological disease or damage. He may have damaged his spine, something that kept him from being able to be very mobile at all. We don't know if this guy could walk or if he had to be carted around by his friends, you know, on a... Uh, on a uh, caught or whatever, but we do know that he was struggling to even be able to function in his life. So that's what that word means. So he's, he's incapable of really taking care of himself, can't have a job, probably wasn't married. So he is now trying to function as this invalid for the last 38 years. Passing by the pool area, Jesus goes into the pool to disrupt the man's disability with mercy. There's once in a while, God will do a miracle in your life a miracle of a changed heart so that you can repair your marriage or you can repair a broken relationship. God can do a miracle spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically. God can, God can heal your body physically. God does, God's in the business of miracles. But many times, the reason he leaves pain in your life and in my life is to let you know that he is God and not you. Because here's what happens, is we go, if God really loved me, he'd take away all this X, Y, Z things in my life. That's not actually true. Sometimes God loves you and leaves those in there to train you about who actually runs the show. Because if, if God did everything we wanted him to do every time, if he's like a vending machine, God, I want this pain gone. God, I want this relationship fixed. And God just went, ding, 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 ding. Literally, we would think we were God. And God's just our puppet doing our work. So God leaves those things in there for a reason. I want you to understand, pain is in your life for a reason. Sometimes God takes it away, miraculously, and those are great days. But sometimes that doesn't happen. But there is a purpose. So don't lose hope. God's desire is to be loving to us and merciful to us in our pain and to show us who we are through our pain. You will get the clearest view of who you are when things don't go the way you want them to go. It's like having your kids. You get to see how well you parented your kids when they don't get what they want. If this has ever happened in your house, or this, or this, or some other whatever, You oftentimes get to see where your kids' hearts are at when they don't get what they're asking for. You as a parent want to bless your kids. You want to give them the desires of their heart. But sometimes they ask for things that are either reckless or wrong or you can't afford. Maybe all of the above. <laughs> or maybe just as a parent, you're like, I don't want to give that to you. And that's my, that's my prerogative as a parent. You're like, there's nothing wrong with it. I can afford it, but you're not getting it, son. And then you see the stomping and yelling and running and whatever else. But you get to see, it, there's a window into the heart when disappointment happens. And many times disappointment happens when there's pain. Why, why, am I, why is my body like this? Why can't I do the things I used to do? Why are my eyes going? Why, you know, whatever. And you either turn to God in those moments with your disappointment or you turn inward and get angry and bitter. Pain is often the discoverer of that moment. That's why God leaves it in our lives the majority of the time. Look at this. Um, here's a model of the, of the uh, pools. So Bible critics said John made this story up because they had never found a five, a five colonnaded pool. Pools like Roman, the Roman pools and Jewish pools are always four-sided. So they're like, a five-sided pool doesn't even make sense. Like we've never seen a five-sided pool in our lives. And so they said that John, this story was made up and wasn't real because he was talking about a pool that they had never seen before. Well, guess what? This is one of the only pools they've ever found that's, that's dual leveled. 
has dual levels. It's two pools that are at different levels. And so there's, there's a colonnade all the way around it as a square, but then there's one that cuts right through the middle as a fifth wall, as a fifth colonnade. And they, they mocked this story for years because John didn't know what he was talking about. And then they actually found the footings of this pool. And so here's a model of what it may have looked like in the, back in the day. So four sides all the way around, one running right through the middle. And it was colonnades, which means they're big columned roofed areas where people that were sick or um, infirmed or disabled could get out from underneath the, the sun so they didn't bake and could be there near the pool, which they felt would heal them. Here is the archaeological digs that have happened over the last couple of decades. And... Um, you can see how deep this particular one is. It's, it's been sent, built, uh, there was like a, a pagan temple built over it. The, the Crusaders built over it. Crusaders built over everything uh, in the Middle Ages. And, but this pool over the last 2,000 years has been filled in. And so they had to dig down, like, I think like 50 feet to find the footings of this, of this pool. And here's a picture of the actual stairs they found. So this, this uh, story of John 5 Imagine the guy laying right there on those stairs as the grassy area at the bottom. It still gets wet to this day because it's, it's filled in by silt now and, and, uh, and uh, rocks, but water still pushes up from beneath. Like it still has water coming into it. And those are the original stairs of John 5. So Jesus would have walked literally right by these stairs while all these people are around underneath these colonnades waiting for the angel to stir the water for a, for a miracle. God's desire is to be loving and merciful to us in our pain and show us who we are through our pain. How many of you guys have ever had a toothache? Like six people again. We got some good dental work up, up in here. So I have, I, uh, I had molars on both sides of my mouth, but particularly on this left side that had broken and fractured over years. And because I didn't have a high value for going to the dentist, I just decided, hey, it's not a big deal. I'll just deal with it at some point. I'll pay the piper later. But I knew the day of pay paying the piper was coming. Well, one, at one point, this whole one back here in the back shattered on the bottom. And a root, uh, a nerve ending was exposed. And if you've ever had the joy of having a nerve ending exposed in your mouth, literally you can't even breathe. The air you breathe is so cold when it touches it, it goes, gah, 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 gah. the nerve goes, hey, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. I'm irritated. It lets you know what's going on in your mouth. So this started to happen. You know what happened? It went on for months, almost three months. Shows you how stubborn your pastor is about some things. <laughs> Here's what I did though, ready? Here's what I did is I started to chew and drink on one half of my mouth. So literally I would drink something and I would tip my head so gravity pulled it all the way to this side so I could swallow it without it lighting me up. For months I went through that because the pain was excruciating. I, I literally, I, I would dread eating and drinking. But my body goes, hey dude, we need some food. My mouth was going, let's not do that. <laughs> so I, I, I changed the way I ate so I didn't have to deal with the pain. Because I knew this, I couldn't fix it. I couldn't get in there and, and root out the problem. I needed a professional. I needed somebody outside of myself to fix myself. And then I finally got it done. And guess what? I went to a dentist and I had oral surgery. And if you ever had the joy of oral surgery, watching parts of your face come flying out of your mouth as he pulled out the, the, all the dental work I needed to get done. Well, guess what happened after that? It was as nightmarish as I thought it was going to be. It was as bad. For three days, I drank my own blood as I slept and just until your mouth heals. Your mouth is one of the slowest things to heal. And so for days and days and days, I'm tasting my blood. I'm drinking my blood. At night, I wake up and it was, a, it was an absolute disaster. But guess what? That wasn't on the surgeon. The surgeon fixed me. It was on me 
because I let it go that far and I, I decided to get, a, I tried to go around the pain rather than deal with what the issue was. So the surgeon caused me pain, but it was pain that brought my healing. I didn't want that pain, but I knew I needed that pain to get over the pain of what the problem was so I could be healed, so I could have no pain. And let me encourage you with something. Pain is a siren call into your life that says, we got some issues. You got things you're not dealing with well, relationally, financially, health-wise, drugs, whatever it is. There are things that God goes, hey, let's stop that. And we go, nope, I think we're good because it's legal. The doctor said I can have these prescription drugs. Everybody says my, my addiction's fine. Because we live in a culture where they don't want anybody to be offended. But it's so bad that we don't want you to be offended while we watch you destroy yourself. Rather than saying, dude, you need to stop that, son. You're going to die. But rather than having people be offended and sad, <laughs> we'd, ra we'd rather have them jump off a cliff and die rather than stop them, which is the poison of our culture. And Jesus right here goes after this guy he knows there's going to be pain for this guy, but it's pain that's going to change his life because he should be over the pain he's in now. And Jesus is going to walk and mercifully help him in this moment. Number two, sin can be our greatest disruptor. Jesus, number one, Jesus journeys to disrupt lives. He's going to disrupt this guy's disability and he's going to create a miracle, which will be awesome. But sin oftentimes can be our greatest disruptor. As a long-term resident of the pool, Jesus chose him on purpose. He's been there for 38 years. Jesus asked him an obvious question about wanting to be healed to check his sincerity. This is crazy. Here's your boy right here. Year one, year five, year 10, year 12, year 13 and a half, year 18, year 28, year 31, year 36, year 37, year 37 and a half, year 38. You've been laying at this pool for 38 years. And here's the thing. If you're laying at that pool as a, as a, as a person with disabilities, you, have, you, you believe something, something's been happening at that pool because you're laying there for a reason. Somebody's getting healed. So the idea was, uh, some of your Bibles say this, some of your Bibles don't. There's an extra verse in some of your Bibles that, that, that give the description to this, that an angel came down and stirred the waters. And the first person in the water got their infirmity healed. So you as that guy have been laying there for 38 years. You've obviously seen it happen of some sort of, something's happened for you to keep on hoping that'll change. And I love Jesus. He walks in the pool area and he searches this guy out. Hey, where's that dude that's been here for like almost 40 years? And he finds him. And you know the first question he asks him? Hey, you want to be healed? <laughs> what? Hey, you want to be healed? Yeah, I asked you, I asked you, I asked you a question. <laughs> of course I want to be healed. Why do you think I've been laying here for 38 years, man? <laughs> yeah, I want to be healed. Wouldn't that be great? Why are you asking me a question like that? That's pretty stupid. <laughs> I, you know what I love about Jesus? He just comes in and just wrecks this guy's shop. He asks him a question, do you want to be healed? He already knows the answer. He already knows how long he's been there. You know why he does that? Because he wants to check the sincerity of his heart. And here's the reason that's true. is because if, if you've been there for 38 years, why aren't you at the edge of the pool with one of your homies just, hey, dude, when the, just, I need you to hang out here for a couple hours or a couple days with me. When the angel stirs that thing, I just want you to dump me in the pool. <laughs> You've been there for 38 years, man. Not two weeks. In 38 years, you should be able to make it in the pool. <laughs> in 38 years, you should have figured out how to get in the pool. Man, if that was me, I'd be laying halfway in the pool, like with the water like in my face. <laughs> like I'd be waiting for the angel to push me over. I'll be mean, telling a guy, dude, if you, see the, if you see this water getting stirred, just step on my face and push me in the water. <laughs> I mean, give me a break. And you know what I love about Jesus? He walks up and goes, hey, you want to be healed? And the guy's like, dude, that's the dumbest question I've ever heard. No, it's actually not. 
Because you know what? The immediate thing he tells Jesus, he gives him an excuse. I try to get in the water, but everybody gets in before me. I got light. It's so bad. I just can't. I've been trying and trying and trying. I've been trying and trying and trying. I've been trying, Jesus, and just no one helps me. Dude, it's been 38 years, son. Figure it out. You think there's a miracle that's going to happen here? Yeah, I think there's a miracle that's going to happen here. Well, then get in, the, get in the pathway of that miracle, son. And look at this. Here's a, I hope this speaks into your life. God's, here's our principle. God's blessings often start at the end of our excuses. You know, we live in a culture of excuses. We live in a culture that has trained us and our children hey, bad's been done to you. And so that affects you for the future. Like you can't move on until, you know, because these things happen. I didn't have a dad. And so I got these things. My dad was an alcoholic. And so I got a drink. You know, my mom was really verbally abusive. And so that's why I speak so vulgarly. You know, I, I had bad teachers in school. That's why I'm not a very good student. You know, I had a bad boss or else I'd be making more money. You know, I, these cops keep picking on me and I keep driving 150 and I don't figure, I, I don't understand why they keep pulling me over. Like, I mean, come on. So why are you picking on me? Like, I have to drive 150 because, you know, it settles my, my heart. <laughs> like, co cops don't want me to stay alive, I guess. They must hate me. Like, listen to me, ready? Everybody has an excuse. In our culture, because we don't want people to feel bad, we allow them to give an excuse about why they act a certain way, and so we encourage them to die. It's like, it's like if you struggle with self-image stuff, you, you have anorexia or bulimia or whatever, and it's like, you see typically a young lady, and it... And she goes, hey, you know, I, I, I think I'm fat or whatever. I don't like the way I look. Or it, it's like telling her, hey, you know what? That's cool. You know, just, hey, just stop, keep, keep stop eating and everything will be fine. <laughs> you just go, why would you do that? Why would you encourage someone into their death? Why would you encourage someone into their deception of how they view themselves? They're obviously broken. There's something inside of them that needs counseling. There's something that needs, that needs somebody to walk alongside of them, not to tell them everything's fine because I don't want you to feel bad. Oftentimes, God's blessing comes at the end of our excuses. When we say, yeah, I've had a tough time up to this time. I didn't have a dad, I didn't blah, blah, Whatever your excuses are, okay. But then you deal with what you've got and you move forward in God's grace. Because God can do something great with you. But if you keep making excuses, then you just, you're always handicapped by what the blessings God has for you. Because you, I can't go over there. I can't do that thing or whatever. I'm an invalid. I've been here for 38 years. I love this. Jesus doesn't even deal with his excuses. Why you been here? I don't know. It's just nobody helps me. And Jesus goes, get up. <laughs> get up. You want to know why? Because dad's here. Because God's here now. And I just fixed you. I'm moving past your excuses to give you blessing in your life. Listen to me. Stop your excuses. Stop. Stop letting your excuses keep God from blessing your life. Own up to what's true of yourself. Own up to what your past is, but then move forward with God's power and God's grace. Be a man or woman of God because that's where God's blessing. God's blessing's in your future. Stop dealing with the past dysfunctionally. Even the baby agrees. So listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> Ready? Surprisingly, Jesus heals only one of the many there, showing his objective wasn't to ease everyone's afflictions, but rather to display his power as savior God. This is really interesting. Jesus walks into a place and doesn't just heal everybody. He doesn't just wave his hand and go, hey, thousands of people here waiting to get in the pool. I heal all of you. He picks out one guy that's been there the longest and he goes, I'm gonna heal you. So what does that mean? That means that God allows suffering in everybody's life because health and pleasure is not the highest goal that God has for you. It's this, ready? Here's our principle. God cares more about holiness than happiness and about our Christ-likeness more than our comfort. Woo! Isn't that the worst sentence you've ever read in your whole entire life? <laughs> because our culture says this, hey, we, you wanna be happy, wealthy, and wise, and just, you know, we don't want our kids to hurt. We don't want our kids to feel bad. We wanna, you know, our, our coaches to put our kids in when they can't even play. You know, we want our teachers to like give A's when our kids haven't showed up for class in a year and a half. 
You know, it's like as parents, we want our kids to be like, hey, no, 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 my kid, I want my kid to struggle. I don't want my kid to feel bad. And really, literally, it's in the struggle sometimes that we become the men and women of God that we're supposed to be. If you've ever done athletics, the most, the, one of the most difficult things is getting in the weight room or going for a run. Who likes to run? Nobody here that's sane, okay? I mean, running's the worst. Running's horrible. It hurts your lungs, hurts your knees, hurts your legs. But you know why you go to run? It's because you want to get better. You literally have to put your body through pain to get to where you want to be. So same thing spiritually is, is true physically, the same thing is true spiritually. God cares more about our holiness, which means get rid of the evil in your life. And many times pain is the avenue where God goes, hey, let's deal with that thing. And we go, ah, I don't want to do that though. It's going to, the, the, the tooth isn't going anywhere, son. That nerve is going to tell you every day I'm still here. So when are we ready to deal with that in your heart? Ah, it's going to hurt though. Yep. I'm going to drink my own blood for three days. Yep. But guess what? Once you're healed, you're free of pain. Once you're healed, you'll be the way you're supposed to be. And you'll feel the blessing of God. God cares more about our holiness than our happiness and our Christ-likeness more than our comfort. I want to encourage you. God loves you. God isn't out to inflict pain. My, my point here today being out of this story, God uses the pain in our life for a purpose. And sometimes that pain ends, which is glorious. In this time, at this point in this man's life, his pain ends. God, Jesus heals him to show, he's, to show he, he is God in the flesh instantly. But the purpose wasn't just to make everybody healthy. The purpose was, I'm going to use this man for my glory, which he does in this story, for God's glory. And even all the rest of people who didn't get healed, God still uses the pain to bring them to being closer to God than they would have been without. Which leads us to number three. Number one, Jesus journeys to disrupt lives. Jesus is in the business of disrupting your life, both for the the blessing of it, God just loves to bless his people. And even when he disrupts your life with difficulty, difficulty is given to you to see where your heart's at. Nothing exposes your heart motivations like pain. Where you turn to get your pain dealt with. Is it medication or do you take it to God? Number three, Jesus used disruption to dissect the heart. Jesus used disruption to dissect the heart. Just what I got done saying. The religious leaders, who should have been the most sensitive to God working, criticize the man for carrying his mat and persecute Jesus for doing a miracle. This is crazy. This is, actually, it's one of the most, so not only is it crazy that this guy was like, Jesus asked him, hey, do you want to get healed? Okay, yeah. That's the reason I'm here for 38 years, Jesus. Thanks for Captain Obvious. So that's, that's crazy in and of itself. But you want to even know the crazier part? Here's a guy that everybody knows. 38 years he's been laying there. All the Pharisees and the religious leaders walk by him. Everybody in town knows him. You know who the town guy is that's always in public. Like if a guy's hanging out at the, at the duck pond or whatever uh, every day for 38 years, you go, oh yeah, that's that one weird guy with the red pants or whatever. You know who, who a guy is, right? He plays with the ducks and whatever's going on over there, right? So everybody knows him in town. Literally thousands of people know who this guy is. Same thing with this dude. Jesus goes by, though, and, and, and his name's like, whatever, Bartholomew or Methuselah, and he fixes Methuselah. Methuselah gets up. He's like, first time I've walked in like 40 years. He rolls up his mat, and he picks it, and he starts going to the temple. And imagine everybody going, what? So the religious leaders, Pharisees and Sadducees, who should have been closest to God, they see a literal miracle of God in front of their face. And instead of going, Praise God. I am so glad God changed your life. He totally transformed your life literally in a minute. Instead of that, they go, hey, uh, why are you carrying your mat? <laughs> because I can, number one. So how about, how, about being, how about being happy for me that I got my whole life back? But you're more worried about the fact that I'm carrying my mat across a place. You know what that's called? That's called legalism. Legalism is poison. Because what it does is it says this, my rules are the same as God's rules, even though those are things that God doesn't even care about. 
and I raise my rules up to the same level as God's rules and call it all God. Legalism is poison in the name of God. And nothing could be more perfect than this. You know, you know, one, you know the only reason they didn't like that this man was healed is because Jesus did it and they hated Jesus. So rather than being happy for the guy, they go, you shouldn't be carrying your mat. And you know what was weird? In the Old Testament law, they said, hey, you, shouldn't be, you can't do any work on the Sabbath, which is basically like going to work. It, may, it means making money on the Sabbath. Take a rest. Don't make money your God. Take a day off. Spend time worshiping God. It's what we do on our Sunday. It's the reason we do this in our culture on our Sunday. Don't, don't, don't wear yourself out trying to get wealthy. Take a day off. Breathe. Remember who gives you wealth and the ability to make money. Let's remember our God and work on your family relationships. Like get your family to church and worship God. That's, that's what our Sunday is. Our Saturday was their Sabbath. So yesterday would have been their day where they go, don't do any work. They made up a whole bunch of man-made rules that said, if you pick up a mat and walk, you're working, which wasn't in the Old Testament. That's something they just made up and they called it God's rules. And they criticized Jesus who just did this miracle because they said, oh, you're, you're healing people like a physician, like a guy trying to make money, like a doctor. Even though it wasn't work for Jesus, he just goes, get up. He isn't working like a physician. He's God who can fix things without working. God spoke the whole universe into existence without building anything. He just speaks it and it, and it comes into existence. That's not working. And Jesus does the same thing here. Ready? Legalism is the poison of pride in the name of God. Some of us in here are legalistic, which means we, we think things should be a certain way. And if it's not a certain way, we get angry and call people hypocrites when it's things not even God cares about. So be very careful in your mind if things that, it's things that God cares about or just things you like. Unintimidated, Jesus disrupts the man's life with mercy and the religious leaders' lives with divinity. This miracle pushed both of them into a position of choosing either submission to or rebellion against what was obvious that God was among them in Jesus. Here's our last principle. Many times, God's work creates opposite reactions in people. Isn't that true? You go, hey, I just want to let you know, Jesus changed my life. Oh, really? Yeah, he changed my, you know, my connection with my wife. We were on the verge of divorce or, you know, I felt really sick and God miraculously healed me. And some people go, dude, I've been waiting to hear about that. I, I need God in my life. The miracle that you've had in your relationships or with your physical healing, whatever, I need that in my life. And then some people go, oh, dude, that was just chance. That was just, that's all, that's oh, whatever. Like science. Yo, science. <laughs> like science is like the atheistic add-on to everything. Oh, science can explain that, even though it can't. But maybe sometime in the future it will, which it doesn't. Everybody has, escape, everybody has an escape route around it, what they know is true. You know there's a God. You know he's working in the world, but you don't want that to be true because you don't want God telling you what to do. So we escape the truth by making up things rather than dealing with the God who loves us but asks us to change. Just like a loving father. Just like a loving father.